There's a prayer for everything. There's a psalm that will address every situation that we face in life. In this series, we're looking at many of those psalms. And at first, we looked at uh, when we're afraid, we can pray Psalm 27, which reminds us that God is our light, our salvation, our stronghold, uh, that when we put our trust in him, we'll find ourselves strengthened from within. When we use him as our light, we see things more clearly and we are at rest in him. Uh, we learned from Psalm 74 that when we are disappointed with God, that he can be trusted, that he is good, and that he is at work uh, taking chaos and making it into order. Uh, we learned from Psalm 32 that when we're guilty, when we've sinned, that God doesn't want us to hide from that. He wants us to confess that to him and instead look to him to cover our sins and to become a hiding place for us. And in Psalm 4, we saw how our anger, even if it's justified, needs to be controlled. And we can be silent and angry and learn how to manage that so that we can actually rest. We can go to sleep at night. That's Psalm 4. In this session, I want to look at when we are weary. What can we pray? What Psalms give us rest? Uh, you know, it's ironic that we live in a time when there are so many conveniences that promise to give us rest. So much of technology says, if you have this gadget, you can do this thing faster, quicker, easier. And so many things of life in this life promise comfort and ease and rest. And yet we find ourselves more stressed than ever. In a recent study by the American Psychological Association, they found that of adults, <laughs> 75% uh, find themselves dealing with stress that causes health issues on a regular basis. Uh, for younger people, ages 18 to 34, 61% of women and 51% of men said that they are so overwhelmed by stress on a daily basis that it has these kinds of effects. It occurs to me that maybe what we need are not more gadgets and gizmos and technology, but we need genuine internal rest. Uh, if we are truly just material beings, then maybe material things can promise rest, but they seem to fail. The reality is we are spiritual beings and we are in need of spiritual rest. Augustine said it so well so many years ago in his confession when he wrote, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it rests with you. Psalm 62 is my go-to psalm when it comes to a psalm of rest. Let me just read it to you now. For God alone, my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be greatly shaken. How long will all of you attack a man to batter him like a leaning wall, a tottering fence? They only plan to thrust him down from his high position. They take pleasure in falsehood. They bless with their mouths, but inwardly they curse. For God alone, O my soul, wait in silence. For my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my salvation and my glory, my mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are delusion. In the balances, they go up. They're together, lighter than a breath. Put no trust in extortion. Set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart on them. Once God has spoken, twice have I heard this, that power belongs to God and that to you, O Lord, belongs steadfast love, for you will render to a man according to his work. In this psalm, David is going to offer the reasons for our restlessness and then a recipe for rest. So our restlessness will begin. What are the things that cause us to be restless David begins with this in verse three and four. He speaks of himself as a, as a tottering wall uh, that's, that's getting battered, that's getting uh, pushed down. And uh, this comes out of his experience in ancient Near Eastern shame, honor culture. David was king. He was at the top. He had the highest level of honor. But there were always people that were trying to 
push him down from that role. Uh, you see, the shame honor culture worked in this way, that there was a limited amount of honor. Now, honor was recognition of your greatness by the community. And, and so as king, you had a lot of honor. In order for others uh, to gain honor, it meant that you would lose some of your honor. It was said to be um, agonistic. There's a zero sum game here. There's a limited amount of, of honor and glory. So if you've got this much, then I've got this much. If I want more, then I've got to pull you down. And so David's foes are trying to pull him down. They're pushing, he's a tottering fence, a wall that they're beating against. They're using lies and slander to do so, but they're trying to bring him down to reduce his honor. And I'm gonna call this uh, competition. This is one of the things that causes restlessness. Competition. And we experience this today in all aspects of life, whether that's at work or at school, uh, in sports, in politics, Competition is everywhere, trying to, to put ourselves in front of others to get ahead, to get that promotion, to, to do that thing that will put me ahead of others. It reminds me of when I was a kid and we would play a game called King of the Mountain. We had a big pile of dirt in a vacant lot and uh, we would uh, uh, fight to be on top of that pile of dirt. And one after another, we'd, we'd pull each other down, someone would get to the top and another one be pulled down. And often life can be like that, right? Life can be that kind of competition of getting ahead of everyone else. Um, and it can simply be exhausting. So David seems to be worn down a bit by the competition. The second thing we see is in verse nine, and that is comparison. Comparison. Now, David says, those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are a delusion. And the balances, they go up, they are lighter together than a breath. As human beings, we're very good at categorizing people by, by race, by class, by upbringing, by their social status, by their appearance, uh, their wealth, all these things, we tend to measure people and their value and their worth. But David is saying that if you take all those together, they're nothing, they, they weigh the same. And so it's useless for us to compare ourselves to others. Uh, we're all, uh, equal in one sense, all of us, no matter what we accumulate, no matter what we do in this life, we all end up in the same place, death. Death is the equalizer for them all. And David says, ultimately, our life is, is just a breath. These things that we value, that we compare ourselves to one another with really are not ultimate. Uh, and so we do this, we compare with the neighbor, their grass is greener, their house is bigger, their car is newer, kids are better behaved, and whatever it might be. And we, we try to compete and struggle to keep up because we compare ourselves with others. And David says, that's, that's a waste of time. It's, it's a vain thing because these things ultimately do not matter. Uh, the third word that I would use here, and this is not in the text, but it's, it starts with C, so it helps me remember this, is cash, is money, material goods. Uh, David says in verse 10, put no trust in extortion, set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart on them. Uh, so whether we accumulate wealth illegally through extortion or robbery, or legitimately, uh, it's not going to bring us peace. It's not gonna give us rest. If, we, if we've acquired it illegally, we're gonna live with guilt and with the fear of discovery. And if we accumulate it uh, legitimately, often the accumulation of things doesn't lead to happiness because it just gives us more things to worry about and stress over. Uh, so there's no guarantee of rest in having an accumulation of things. Material goods are not going to give us rest. These all work against rest. But David says, there is a recipe for having rest in God. And there is a key word in this psalm that's translated only. In the Hebrew, it's a, it's a little word, ak, and it occurs six times in the first nine verses of the psalm. And it's, it's clearly a theme, a thread that ties this psalm together. Listen for it here in verse one, for God alone only, surely or ultimately, my soul waits in silence. In verse two, he alone is my rock and my salvation. Verse five, God alone, oh my soul, wait in silence. Verse six, he alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress, I will not be shaken. This word only is the first word of six of the first nine verses of the psalm. It's clearly meant to draw attention to the idea of ultimate. God is only 
ultimate, finally, completely, surely the source of our rest. We read on in, in verse uh, seven, on God rests my salvation and my glory, my mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. In these verses, verses one and two, five and six, uh, these are choruses that are essentially repeated with slight variations. And then verse seven and eight, you add all these together, there's a list of six attributes of God uh, that David reminds himself of that relate to his rest. The first is that God is his rock. It's a place of security, of safety, a place of hiding, a place of shelter, also a place of vision, a place that he can climb above and, and see things more clearly. David says in Psalm 61, this prayer, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Perspective. Resting in God gives him perspective. God is his rock. Second, God is his salvation my salvation. Uh, salvation is, is the rescue uh, aspect of God. God is a savior. He comes in and, and saves the day. He turns the direction of the battle. He reverses things. He is our salvation. A third, he is described as a fortress. As Psalm 27 said, a stronghold. Psalm 46, a mighty fortress is our God. He is a place of rest. In a fortress, you can rest. You can, you can go to sleep because you know that the walls are secure. They're going to protect you from any invader. So a fortress means we can truly rest. David says next that God is his hope. He is my hope. And the, the Hebrew word for hope is rooted in a very literal word, cord. And in the way that a cord connects two things, hope is what connects us to God. Uh, as we when we get married, we talk about tying the knot, taking two people and binding them together with a cord. We can be certain that, that we're, we can rest because we are tied to God. Our hope is in him. We're connected to him. The writer of Hebrews says that we have this hope as an anchor for the soul. The deep connection that we have enables us to rest. Fifth, David says that God is uh, my glory. A glory is that which is important to us, that which is of highest value. And so David is saying, God, you are of ultimate value to me. And all these other things that, that promise something in this life, you know, honor, being better than my neighbor, having material resources, these are not my glory. These are not of utmost important. You are, you are my glory. And finally, he calls God his refuge, like a fortress. A refuge is a place of rest, of safety, of security where David can probably quite literally go to sleep even when he's on the battlefield. David will say in this Psalm, find rest my soul or my soul waits. Uh, both of those translations are, are good translations. It's probably more literal to say my soul waits in silence. And David just quietly waits and therefore is able to rest on God. There's a saying that goes, if the devil can't make you bad, He'll make you busy. Many times we just need to stop and wait and sit in silence and find rest. Let me wrap up just with a couple of practical applications of this text to find rest. I think what this text reminds us of, first of all, is that we need to consider the source of our stress. We need to look at these areas that, that David cites here um, as sources of stress that don't really give us rest. There are many of these things that we are stressed, we're worried about that, number one, we can't change, and number two, they're not that important. In the ultimate, in the final analysis, they're not the most important thing, and they are not worthy of our stress and our frustration and our effort. They're just not worthy. Think of that illustration of the scales. In a balance, they both go up together. David finds rest and strength in focusing on his ultimate, his only, and that is the Lord. Second application would be verse eight. Notice in verse eight where David changes from the first person to, to the first person plural. He's at this point, he is inviting the congregation. He says, pour out your hearts, O people. He's instructing them, you do what I've been doing, pour out your hearts. I love that imagery of pouring out. It comes from a Hebrew word that, that is used for a spring gushing forth water. Pour out your heart to God. I've loved this verse for a long time. I remember encountering it when I was in high school and I wrote this verse on the top of my prayer list because I wanted to be a type of person that prayed 
fully engaged. I could pour my heart out to God. Whatever I felt, I was free to say. And I want you to know that. You can pour out your heart to God. Whatever is causing you stress, whatever's wearing you out, let God know. Pour out your hearts, for he is trustworthy and he is a refuge for his people. The third application of this text would be to do what David did and talk to yourself. In the way it's stated, find rest, my soul. My soul waits in silence. This is an example in the Psalms of self-talk, of David telling himself what to do, to rest. David has to tell himself twice in this Psalm, in the two refrains. We may have to tell ourselves many, many times a day to find rest, oh my soul, in God alone. Speak truth forcefully to ourselves when we need to stop and rest and sit in silence. Finally, this psalm reminds me of something that Jesus said that connects uh, very clearly to his message when he said, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus invites us to come alongside him and experience rest. The yoke of Jesus means that we are bound to him. We are we're pulling with him. We're walking with him. And in doing so, he is bearing the load along with us. We're not alone. He shares that. And we find rest. We find rest because we don't have to struggle for these things because we have the ultimate. We have Jesus. And in him, our souls can rest secure. <music> 